I'm Jonathan Larson with QRT Investigates, and today I'm being joined by Jess Scarane, who's running for the Democratic nomination for Senate in Delaware against incumbent Democratic Senator Chris Coons. Jess, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Jonathan. Can you talk a little bit, introduce yourself to people who are watching, tell us, tell us why you're running? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a Delawarean. Uh, I've lived here in Delaware for the last 10 years. And I'm running because what I see in my city and in my state are a lot of problems that we're facing every single day that are really caused by a broken system of power. And the more I see that, the more I see that it protects the people who are already wealthy and it abuses so many of the rest of us. And I really think that Delaware deserves a senator that's going to take back that power and return it to people and focus on legislating in favor of people. Um, I saw these issues in my city and my state, and I tried to work within that system to fix them through volunteering and joining boards and working with nonprofits that were focused on these issues. But what I've realized is that until we actually change the way these things work, until we actually get a government that puts people at the center, we're not going to be able to nibble around the edges to make real change. Um, I'm running against Senator Coons in particular um, because I haven't seen in his record a focus on legislating in favor of people. Instead, I've watched him repeatedly make compromises with Republicans that come at the expense of Delawareans. He's voted in favor of facilitating Trump's agenda by confirming more than 80 of his judges that have taken over our judiciary, judiciary for a lifetime. He's confirmed quite a few of the members of Trump's cabinet, including the Health and Human Services Secretary, who is against the ACA, which Coons says he supports, who is against the woman's right to choose. And it has also confirmed people like Wilbur Ross, who is known as the bankruptcy king because of what has happened through the recession and his, and his, his work as a financier. So these things I found demoralizing and upsetting. And no matter the many emails or calls I made, his behavior wasn't changing. And that's because he sees the system as one that works for him. He takes quite a few corporate donations. Before I was even in this race, he had raised over $3 million. And what we see is him legislating in favor of those cor those corporations that have given him those campaign bribes. And I I, uh, I I won't be surprising any of TYT Investigates regular fans if I say that I'm not planning on this being a, a conversation about polls or electability. But mm -hmm. I do want to bounce um, a couple poll findings off of you that uh, that I, I looked up before we spoke, obviously. Uh, this was a poll taken late last year by Data for Progress, a progressive think tank. Uh, it's clearly an unreliable poll because this, they're polling Democrats and they say 81% of Democrats said they definitely will vote in the Senate primary, which is not going to happen. Right? <laughs> so so we, know, we know it's not necessarily totally reliable. But I did want to share one finding in specific with you. They asked Democrats, how are they leaning? How are you leaning? Um, how would you lean in the primary, this is in September, uh, if Chris Coons were up against a more liberal Democratic female? They don't they don't give a name. I'm not sure whether you were even in the field yet, but it, that's the no. hypothetical matchup. <laughs> Coons versus unnamed liberal Democratic female. Chris Coons got 32% of the Democrats say they would lean towards Coons. The unnamed more liberal Democratic female got 36% of mm -hmm. the Democratic vote. So I'm wondering, I'm guessing that you're aware of this poll or were, have been yeah. at some point. So I'm wondering what your thoughts were about that. Well, I think what's really interesting about that is that when people in the poll were exposed to the record of Chris Coombs and the votes that he's made, and these, like I mentioned, these people that he's chosen to confirm, um, judges who have very troubling ideological views and cabinet members that are working to actually harm Delawareans and people in our country, that's when his, his support got particularly soft. So that is really was our theory from the beginning, even before that poll came out, when we were talking about launching this campaign, is that when you talk about his record and the way he has been legislating, it absolutely makes people realize that he has not been working in their favor. And that's really what's important to our campaign. And just so people understand, what you're referring to is within the same poll, they did follow up mm -hmm. questions that said, what if you knew this particular fact about Chris Coons or this particular fact? And you could see you're referring to the poll numbers kind of dropping as people yeah. heard those arguments. Exactly. And I want there, there's one specific finding in that poll that I do want to bounce off you. But here's the here's the thing that that kind of struck me. Um, 
you and I have had a few exchanges on Twitter regarding some of my reporting that we'll talk about a little bit later, but I didn't know a whole lot about you other than that sort of niche issue. So I, you know, I turned to Google and I was amazed. I was amazed at how little Delaware, forget national, Delaware coverage there was about not even just like a glowing profile of your campaign, but on specific national issues, there's no, there's virtually no sign of where Chris Coons is on all this stuff, but certainly you're, you're just not there. It was very tough to sort of see from the quote, you know, independent third party, fourth state media, what their mm -hmm. assessment is of you. And so my question is, obviously I'm curious your thoughts about that in general, but also that that provides potentially an impediment to your efforts to get people to know those things that change their opinions about Chris Coons. So talk talk about that a little bit, if you would. Yeah, I think whenever you are running a challenger or insurgent campaign against an incumbent, like you're very unlikely to get the sort of established press in your state to, to, get, to get coverage, right? I mean, that's a fight in general. I think that what our strategy really has been is direct voter contact. Like we are putting forward a goal to knock on more doors than any campaign has ever knocked on because we are finding that that is the best way to deliver our message. And it doesn't get laundered through um, a reporter or through media. It's us being able to talk to people directly. And then that will obviously grow into those people becoming organizers in their own neighborhoods and evangelists for our campaigns. We're really trying to make sure that this is a person to person campaign. Delaware is a really small state. One of the things that people like about their politicians is this idea that you'll see them in the street or in the shopping uh, supermarket or the gym. Now, again, that happens for the people who are very middle class or upper middle class are comfortable. So a lot of people in our state are not seeing their politicians um, day in and day out, but there is value in that. So we're making sure that we are um, doing what people essentially ask for and coming and bringing our message to them. I think we are absolutely going to try to keep pushing on the press and trying to get our name in there more and get our policies talked about more, uh, particularly locally, but I don't think we can really count on it as a, as a vehicle for us. Now, but you just had a race in, in Delaware in 2018, another primary challenge, where people were pretty surprised at how well the progressive challenger did against incumbent Tom Carper. It's true. It's so true. wouldn't, and wouldn't I think you think there would be that appetite? <laughs> yeah, sorry, go ahead. I, I would hope. No, I, I think that's part of, I think you're getting at why they were surprised, because people were not seeing news about it. They were only getting the message when it came to them directly. And I think learning that from that campaign is, is sort of why we've built our strategy the way we have, because we can't guarantee and we can't rely on um, the local media market to send, uh, push our message for us. And Delaware is tricky. I mean, it's it's a small state, so we end up predominantly a large part of our population is in the Philadelphia media market. So there's a lot more going on in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, and it's hard for us to necessarily command command, command attention from that market. Yeah. Um, and there's smaller local papers, but again, they're not necessarily um, interested in covering our campaign. So we're going to try to push that more but we realize we have to do it ourselves. Boy, it's amazing. To me, uh, having been a local reporter, that's an opportunity. The major the, the major market media that usually gobbles up all the access that I'm hoping for, they're ignoring you. I'd be thrilled to pick up the phone and be able to like boost, you know, I, I could break a local story and, and amplify it and elevate it by getting a reaction from you. But you're saying yeah. not happening. We, there's, it's happened. I mean, it did just happen. There was a piece that came out about campaign texting uh, there was a woman who was very bothered by a Bernie Sanders volunteer texting her who took it to the paper. And, you know, they did reach out to us for a comment on that about are we using texting? And, and you know, we gave a comment. So our, we are listed in there. But, but there are so many substantive <laughs> Delaware specific yeah. issues, uh, environmental yeah. stuff, which we'll get to. Oh, uh, really? there, was, there was one thing you, that you referred to just now that I wanted that I was kind of addressed in the poll, which was. Um, as you say, they, they were polled to see how persuasive specific arguments were for not voting for Coons. And one of the things that they said was, what if you knew that Coons had voted to confirm 18 Trump judicial nominees who were opposed by civil rights groups? 
because they refused to endorse the ruling in Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, of course, the historic yeah. desegregation ruling. And uh, uh, what, what I found interesting about that was, although that was generally uh, a very persuasive argument, people were obviously kind of surprised by that, the group with whom that was the least persuasive was black people. 40% of black or African-American Democrats who responded said they found that not persuasive at all. And I don't know if you recall that finding, but I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that in terms of trying to win the black vote. I did not look into that specific finding. I think that what we are encountering is a lot of people who feel completely disenfranchised and dejected and, and disengaged from their political system. So in some ways, maybe that's not surprising because we have a lot of people who just think that's how most people feel. We have incredibly segregated schools in Delaware um, where there have been a lot of people who have either moved outside city limits to change their school district if they have the money and the means to do that, moved over the state line to get into a better public school, put their kids in private schools or charter schools. So since about the 80s, 90s, our school systems have really been um, moving back towards segregation. And I, I could see that if you're living that experience where you don't feel seen by your government, you don't feel seen by your school system, then maybe that's not all that surprising to you and you assume every single judge feels that way. Oh, that's an interesting and, and horrifically dystopian view yeah. on it. I, you uh, know, that's I'm super depressing. That. I can't speak for anyone, but right. based on what I've seen at the doors, there are a lot of people who just feel really like no matter who sits in a seat, their life doesn't materially change. And that's really what the biggest thing we're fighting against in some ways. You mentioned Bernie Sanders before. Have you endorsed him for president? Or are you supporting anyone specifically for president? I don't know that an endorsement from a <laughs> from me is really going to make a difference for his campaign, but that is who I will be supporting in the primary. Yes. And have you got his support? Is anyone, any of the candidates endorsing you? Is any, do you have any names behind you? I think we're, <laughs> we are hoping for some, some endorsements there. We're definitely, many are in the works right now, um, not necessarily with candidates, but with some of the um, progressive groups in, in the country that are working to get candidates like myself elected. What about Bernie? <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> We're definitely working on making a connection there. I don't You're trying you know, to make it happen. Never say never. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We're working all our angles for sure. Um, do you consider yourself a socialist? I consider myself a democratic socialist. Democratic socialist. And, and how do you find that that plays or what do people think that means in Delaware? It's not necessarily a conversation we're having. I think the label that gets put on people is not really relevant to the people at the door. I mean, I've had conversations with people who are Republicans and start saying, no, I'm never going to vote for a Democrat. But then when I start talking to them about what I believe in and the way I think our country should work, they soften up. So I'm not leading with a label around party or around right. identification. I'm right. leading with, don't you think our country should work with every single for every single one of us? So and the media may be obsessed with those labels, but the voters, they're not interested. No, I mean, I don't think that's the conversation that people need to have. It, there are some people who that matters to, but most of the time I'm having a conversation with people who are saying, I don't make enough money, or I can't afford to keep my roof over my head, or I have medical debt, or my husband's on dialysis and I can't afford to, to um, pay for it. These are the conversations I'm having. Like people aren't, I'm not going to the door and asking people I know how they're registered, but they're not asking me exactly how I identify, right? Like that's not the, that's not what's going to make a difference in people's lives. Right, right. Um, how is the, I want to dive into some specific issues, but uh, just a couple more questions about the race itself and, and what it means to campaign as an insurgent. How's the democratic yeah. establishment uh, treating you? The DNC, the DSCC, uh, people who are not supposed to have thumbs on the scale, but sometimes their thumbs seem to show up in places where <laughs> people don't yeah. want them. Yeah, especially lately, right? Um, I think that our local party has been incredibly welcoming to challenges in more recent years. Um, they say outwardly that they're staying neutral in primaries, which I much appreciate. Um, we haven't really run into anyone from a national level. I think that mostly we're being ignored, which, again, to your point, last time they ignored and, and we made some progress. So hopefully right. 
if they're going to continue to ignore us again, we'll continue making progress and, and surprising people this year. So Chris Coons' big thing, his big selling point, I think I think Politico referred to him as the GOP's favorite Democrat. His big thing yep. is bipartisan cooperation. And obviously that plays into the, the National Prayer Breakfast, which we'll, we, we will get to. But um, isn't bipartisan cooperation a good thing in principle, at least? I mean, in theory, but it depends on who ends up being compromised. And I think that's the problem I really have. The issue is not compromising. The issue is not compromising with Republicans. The issue is when you've, it, you've made a decision to compromise, but the people who aren't in the room are the ones who are being hurt by that compromise. And that's the stuff that I see over and over. You know, he has touted a, a bipartisan bill in the budget committee. That is the first time in something like 19 years that they've come together and, and, and agreed on bipartisan rules for the budget committee. However, what those rules are, are really a way to stop progressive progress in the case of a President Bernie or President Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren. Um, what they do is they say, and I don't really want to get into weeds on things, but it says a bill has to have a CBO score and it has to have projections of, of what it will do to the budget or, or um, you know, a spending. A deficit. And, yeah. Exactly. And if it doesn't meet those projections, then it triggers automatic austerity. That is the last thing that we need, particularly because perhaps the reason that something doesn't meet projections is because of a recession. The last thing you should be doing in a recession is triggering automatic austerity to programs like Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. So this is something that they're touting as being a positive bipartisanship. We got something done, but we can't just be proud of getting something done if that something actually hurts people or does no good for our country. And that's the thing that I struggle with. That's the problem I have. Like we're all glad handing and clapping each other on the back for accomplishing something when the people who actually have to live with those decisions are recognized are going to be the ones who get the most hurt. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the very worst things that we've seen come out of our politics were passed with a lot of self-congratulatory uh, remarks about the fact that it was bipartisan. Everyone agreed right. to do this terrible thing. Yeah. Exactly. Doesn't that make it worse? I mean, doesn't that be a reason for us to be appalled that you right. all agreed to hurt us in this way? <laughs> and that's the type of politics that I'm just sick of seeing. It's right. easy to say that, yes, we should get along. It's easy to point to polls that say people just want Congress to get things done, but right. they don't want things, they don't mean they want Congress to get things done that harm them. Right, 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 right. Um, so let's talk about a few specific issues. And if I don't mention Chris Coons, consider it an, an invitation to compare and contrast <laughs> his record and his position with yours. So I want to start with uh, climate change. He's got a new bill out uh, which would um, tax emissions and then use the revenues from those taxes to fund infrastructure. Uh, what are your thoughts on the bill and, and more broadly on climate change and environmental records? I think what I feel about that is that it, we know it's not enough. And what I fear about is something like that is, again, clapping ourselves on the back, saying we did something, and then moving on to the next issue and failing to realize that it's not actually saving anyone. That bill in particular, or there's versions of the bill, some of them exclude um, military fuels, which the military is one of the biggest polluters in the world. So if we completely exclude the fuel usage of military, what dent are we really making? It also um, would remove regulations on emissions. So we're saying the, 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 again, compromise is that we're going to get rid of all of these emission regulations because we're taxing you now. So there's no reason that you would ever break these emission standards. I completely disagree with that. I think the emissions would have to stay in place. And I think a carbon tax has to be part of a bigger project. It doesn't include anything about public transit. Like, we know that people would ride public transit if it was accessible and free and made their lives better. Most people don't want to sit in a car for more than two hours of their day getting where they're going. A lot, a lot of cities are, are of trying to look, are looking now at providing free public transportation. Yeah, I believe Kansas City has and has had a lot of um, increase in ridership and, and is seeing success from it. These yeah. are public goods. These are the yeah. things we should be investing in. Right. Um, so and they have they have a, a, a cost benefit to them because when you increase people's mobility, you increase their ability to get to work, which means they've got more options in terms of the jobs they take. Employers get better employees. People are able to go out shopping more easily. You yeah. stimulate business. Yeah, there's a lot of exactly. obvious benefits exactly. to it. So exactly. you talked about you talked about um, 
uh, Coons's bill as representing compromise. And I wanted to bounce off you something that uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, said recently uh, regarding Bernie Sanders and um, his health care proposals. And she basically said, look, the worst case scenario is we don't get through everything, but we still end up with something that's that's something like, you know, maybe like a public option or, or something like along those lines. And and I think she got a fair amount of blowback or maybe an unfair amount of blowback about the idea of, no, you don't you don't compromise and you certainly don't talk beforehand about the possibility that you will. So where do you come down on her specifically suggesting President Sanders might compromise on health care and more broadly on the, on that approach? When you know, when do you compromise? When is why is a Bernie Sanders compromise? OK, but not a Chris Coons compromise. Yeah, well, I think she made a good point that she's speaking for herself, not the Sanders campaign, right? And same to me here. I think what you don't compromise is vision. I think what you don't compromise is values, because those are the things that are the flag that you are planting in the ground and saying, we all agree we want to march toward that flag. What you can maybe compromise are the steps that you take to get there, but you cannot say that you're willing to completely throw away the policies that you believe in to just get something done, like we said before. So I believe that we should be championing getting to a single payer system. I believe that Bernie is putting forward a good plan that essentially just lowers the age that is uh, eligible for it over years and gets everyone The system's covered. already in place. We're just right. widening the door. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, there are changes that we want to make to Medicare to make it more comprehensive because it doesn't cover enough now. But that should be the vision. And the steps that we take to get there, yes, that is the part that we're going to have to talk about and figure out how we move people along. But I also think that what Chris Coons doesn't do and fails to realize could be powerful is that he doesn't organize. He doesn't take any po um, of the public energy to put it behind any ideas or get their input on what those, those tactics and those ideas should be. And I think that's the big difference when you look at more progressive candidates and representatives. They recognize that it's not, it's not their job to just look at polls or look at where people are at and say, oh, okay, people are here, that's how I have to vote. It's our job to be a leader of those people and actually push them along and bring them with us and build that power behind the idea so that those people can push for more representatives to get elected who share those values or share those ideas. So those people can be the people who go and knock on the door of the, the representative who's blocking it and, and make their voices heard. This isn't, our government does not, it, it should not just be the, the few people who sit in those seats making the decisions. It has to be a more engaged system. And I think that's one of the changes that I would want to see. We've, um, all of us have kind of sat back and let it run. And I think that that's why we've gotten to the place where we are, where we don't feel represented because these people aren't representing us, because we haven't held them accountable or because we haven't been engaged. And I'm not faulting just people for that. There are obviously much larger structures of power in place there. But I think those are the structures that we have to start breaking down, because then when you, you build political will, that's how you actually get stuff done. It sounds like you're suggesting that if, if you're in office, you're you're going to be using that that state level bully pulpit to to still be an activist in some senses. I would hope so. I, I don't understand why you wouldn't. I think that we are. That's what a leader does. They set vision and then they help people get there. It's not just for me to to make the decisions for people. Right. I'm saying I believe this is what we should be doing. Now, you guys tell me how you think we should get there. And I think that should happen across state lines as well. I mean, that's, we've seen that happen historically where uh, I think actually Bernie Sanders is a good example of back probably in the 80s or 90s when IBM was trying to cut people's pensions. He went and found, I believe it's Minnesota, he went and found another representative who represented a district that had a ton of people that worked for IBM in it and they came together and they organized those people and they pushed back against it. And that's how I think we should actually be governing. We should be saying, how do we bring the people into this system, not how do we get them out of it and just placate them with things that make it seem like we're working for them while we just do what we need for ourselves and our corporations and our, and our fellow ruling class. So also on the um, subject of health care, uh, reproductive rights, if I remember correctly, was one of the things that came up in that the, the uh, poll that I referenced earlier. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, and, and you probably know this better than I do, I believe some of the judges that Chris Coons has voted to confirm 
were actually either uh, not willing to say that they recognize the precedent of Roe v. Wade, or I'm again, tell me if I'm wrong, expressed hostility to to Roe v. Wade, yeah. but but got his vote, his confirmation vote anyway, because technically speaking, they were you know qualified. And yeah. so, talk a little bit about your where you are on reproductive rights and where what your assessment is of where Senator Coons is. Yeah, I, I he does use that term qualified often, right? And I look at it and, and with those particular judges, I say qualified to do what? Like take away our rights because they are outwardly or at least in, implicitly saying they will. And he voted to confirm Kurt Engelhart, who is now one of the judges who is both working to dismantle the ACA and working to push Roe back to the Supreme Court. So you have facilitated the agenda of these right-wing minority groups who are looking to take away rights from people in our country, particularly women. Uh, my stance on choice is, for me, it goes even beyond abortion. Abor abortion is about women's bodily autonomy. And do women have control over their own bodies or do they not? And I believe wholeheartedly that they do. I believe we need to repeal the Hyde Amendment. And I believe that all women's health care services should be part of Medicare for All. Um, Can you explain are, just are, quickly sure. what, what the Hyde Amendment is? for? Absolutely. The know. Hyde Amendment very simply prevents federal dollars from being used uh, for abortion services. So it limits things like when if, if Planned Parenthood, for example, gets federal funding, it has to very carefully say what it uses those dollars for. Anyone in the military? Exactly. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. yeah. So it, it limits any dollars that come from the U.S. government from being put toward um, abortion services, no matter who's delivering it, military, TRICARE, tri uh, Planned Parenthood. Now, but Coons um, has been endorsed, at least in the past, I don't know about in your race, by, by Planned Parenthood, if I yeah, have that he right. Just again. Yeah, he just goes again. And I think that's unfortunate. No more thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think that, that that really disappointed me. I think I would have liked an opportunity to actually maybe have an interview with them and actually talk about my views on it. But that endorsement was made without um, any conversation with our campaign. But after you were in the race? Yeah. Not, and had you reached out to them before the uh, before they issued their endorsement? I had spoken um, with our local chapter, and that's really where I am focused. Like, I'm focused on talking to the people who are on the ground here. I think that's actually where you make better inroads, necessarily. They're, you know, they obviously, I'm not speaking for them, they obviously are tied to that national organization, but it's much more important to me to talk to people on the ground um, in our state. And, but they don't have the, the uh, autonomy to endorse on their own. It's not like the Delaware. Exactly. They are, right. And they are not the action fund. Obviously, they are the right. nonprofit Planned Parenthood who is unable to endorse in any race. Of and course. So, yeah. That makes sense. Um, uh, talk about reparations, if you would, where you are on reparations. Yeah, I think that we know that over hundreds of years, Black wealth and Black property has been stolen. I think we absolutely have to do something about that. I think we should be studying it and figuring out the best way to do it and, and then doing it. To me, it's simple. Uh, it, we shouldn't be debating whether we should even study it at the very least. I think one of the ways that we've seen it, particularly in Delaware, is when we talk about history of redlining. Um, you can see where neighborhoods were uh, redlined, and it, it lingers today. Yeah, they the, red li the redlining yeah. across the country may no longer be legally in effect. But if you were to draw those lines today, they still coincide with demographic exactly. and income lines and all kinds exactly. of, yeah, exactly. it's, it's, a, Even just it's environmental a scar. Pollution. There's yeah. some of our worst polluted neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, you say red line's not allowed today, but another thing Chris Coons has done is that he voted to repeal parts of Dodd-Frank that made it harder for banks to lend money in a discriminatory way. And of so course, there's they, also things like reverse redlining, which has to do with where you actually put your uh, your your uh, brick and mortar outlets. Yeah. And if you don't put any Absolutely. of those in in neighborhoods of color, yeah. disenfranchised, poor neighborhoods, then they it's not like you're denying loans, but no one's even going to show up to ask no for them. No one could find you. Exactly. Right. We right. I mean, we have many banking deserts, which is, you know, humorous, given that we are one of the banking capitals of the country. Uh, we have many food deserts. These are the things, these are the lingering issues that we still see in our state because of years and years of discriminatory um, behavior by the state and by the federal government. 
Um, I think that there are, I don't necessarily have the answer for the, the vehicle that reparation should take. I think it could be in things like mortgage programs. I think it could be in things like education programs. I don't know exactly. I think that's the part that we have to spend the time figuring out, but I don't think there should be debate about whether we should do it. Is there anything that you've heard in terms of uh, what reparations might look like that you think that's that's not somewhere I'm willing to go? Not that I've heard, no. Okay. Um, so uh, let's talk about my reporting. <laughs> uh, this, is, <laughs> this is how you and I first sort of, I don't remember whether you got on my radar first or vice versa, but uh, um, the, the reporting that we did wrapping up roughly a year ago, um, sort of involved a, a bunch of Delaware institutions and people. There's a poultry company named Mount Air, which is actually headquartered, I believe, in Arkansas, but but its operations, essentially, De Delaware is sort of, Delmarva is, is the heart of it. Their CEO is a guy named uh, Ron Cameron, and it all connects to the family, which people might know from the Netflix documentary last year, better known, at least previously, as the Fellowship Foundation, uh, which had has had some scandals uh, in the past. Uh, it's a relatively secretive Christian group, but but I'm going to throw it over to you and sort of say and ask you to sort of tie those together in terms of what your when you tell this story to people, um, how do you tell this story? How do you explain how these things are all connected? Yeah, it's not a simple story in a lot of ways, right? Because it's all very. I mean, the fellowship and the family are intentionally secretive, so. It's not just out in the open, but I, it is important for Delawareans to understand about the, what is important about Del for Delawareans to understand about the progress is, is that the, that intersection that you're talking about, where it intersects with the poultry business and where it intersects with Chris Coons. So I know that prayer breakfast attendees like to talk about it being a nonpartisan, non-political event, but that's clearly not true. Uh, we know it's really all about power and influence, and, and that's what they're peddling at this event. And for and people who we, don't know, Chris Coons has been a co-chair. Exactly. He mm -hmm. has spoken publicly at the breakfast, which, of course, is the main event that the Fellowship Foundation does every year. Uh, and he has also uh, been part of the Poultry Caucus in the Senate, which yep. the, the purpose of it, of course, is to facilitate uh, poultry industry uh, needs, desires, and so on. Ron Cameron is a former board member of the Fellowship exactly. Foundation. And You're telling also the story the for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So exactly. So, well, like no, you said, I mean, it, these it are the is connections. complicated, and I don't know. I don't, I don't always know how much people know, even people who follow it's TRT true. investigates about our, our past true. reporting. And it and it feels like it's in the weeds, right? And it feels like, why are you telling me this? But there's a reason. And one is okay. So first, fellowship, as we said, really, it was born out of a a desire to quash labor movements and worker power. Right. Like, I think that's important to not forget. This is about power. And today it's an organization that is quietly but effectively supporting anti LGBTQ laws across the world, which is something that I don't believe anyone in America should be perpetrating. And I especially don't think a Democrat should be. As you mentioned, Ron Cameron was on the board of the fellowship, donated millions of dollars to that organization. And he is a massive election financier typically funding in the figures of the millions of dollars. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say, but not in Delaware. Well, exactly. So he typically funds um, Republicans in, in the millions of dollars that he puts towards Republicans or against Democrats, but he does not spend against Delawarean senators. And that is because he is the CEO of Nanterre, which is a poultry producer, as you said, who, who has large plants in our state. Um, he gets what he needs from our Democratic senators. They, as you said, Chris Kuhn started the Chicken Caucus in the Senate, which includes senators from states where the poultry business operates. And they, Chris Kuhn is one of the benefactors of the National Chicken Council, who has given him over $30,000 in campaign donations. And now he's turned that into using his power to legislate in favor of these powerful chicken companies. So he has, for example, sponsored legislation that actually exempts these large poultry processing plant plants from reporting their emissions. 
here's why this is incredibly important to Delaware. Downstate, there are about 100 people right now who have poisoned drinking wells because of Mount Air. And the response to that has been nothing from our federal delegation. Mind you, 20 miles away, there are all another town that also has poisoned public, public drinking water. And our federal delegation was quick to write a statement and say, we need clean water, clean water is a right. But the difference is there's no perpetrator in that other town. We don't know what the source of that is. We know what the source of the water in, in Millsboro is. poisoning is in Millsboro. It's Mount Air. They and, failed yeah. to properly dispose of wastewater. They failed to properly dispose of chicken waste sludge. And it has now poisoned people. And we hear nothing from our senator who takes their money and legislates in their favor. And this is what I'm talking about when I say that we need a senator who is actually going to work to represent the people that elected him. And just so people know, um, this is this is not a niche thing. This is not a trivial thing. And it's funny because we're talking about chicken waste, so it has that inherent quality. But I was literally right. about to ask you about the environmental issues. There are issues with ammonia yeah. being released into the air. Absolutely. There are issues with the water, the groundwater being poisoned. When I was uh, looking into this stuff, I t there is a very real activist movement. There are activists on the ground who do nothing but research this stuff and track the environmental impacts. And you, it is not hard to find people out there who will say, you know, my, my family's health uh, deteriorated precisely because of this. My property values have gone through the floor because of this. This is a definite, this is an absolutely real issue that is devastating specific communities. Um, and, and as, as we discussed earlier, uh, the, the Ron Cameron's money gets wielded against Democrats all over the country uh, with no implications for Delaware or the chicken business, whatever. Right. This is just a guy, in fact, he spent, Ron Cameron spent the 2018, the night of the midterm elections, he was at the yep. White House with Trump watching the returns. Um, yep. And uh, this year's prayer breakfast, Chris Coons was there, of course, and the morning of the prayer breakfast, uh, he had an op-ed published, or uh, an opinion piece published. I want to read you um, a, a quick excerpt from it where he's talking about the 2017 National Prayer Breakfast and what was going through his mind as he was preparing to go and appear at that prayer breakfast alongside Donald Trump. He, he writes, I debated challenging him publicly for the Muslim travel ban, but the night before the event, Max, a trusted friend and Howard Divinity School graduate, reminded me of Jesus's calling in Matthew to pray for our enemies. He challenged me to believe in the power of prayer, to preserve this event's focus on prayer, and to confront Trump separately. I wrestled with his advice all night, but around midnight, I decided he was right. I would have plenty of chances to speak out against the president's ban, but I had only one opportunity to help preserve an important national event focused on prayer. And given what we heard from Trump at the event, hours or just hours after this came out, I found myself wondering whether Chris Coons might have actually helped preserve the event, which is billed as a nonpartisan event, if he had actually done what he said he shouldn't have done and challenged him. And, and, and so that's what I was wondering. That's what went through my mind. But I'm wondering whether what, what your thoughts are and your response to, to what Coons wrote there. Yeah, I, I think that when we are talking about a leader like Trump and leader is in quotes there, I don't think we should be giving up any opportunity to stand against his agenda. I think that we are in a place in our country that we have not been, at least in my lifetime. And we should absolutely not be sitting beside that man and seeming, even if not outwardly, seeming like we are uh, condoning his agenda or his words or any of the ways that he chooses to present himself. So, um after the after Trump spoke, Trump, of course, uh, came out at this event, which Chris Coons has helped preserve for its focus on prayer, and uh, and slammed Republican uh, Republicans and Democrats. And he specifically said, "Nor do I like people who say I pray for you when they know that's not so." This is hours yeah. after Chris Coons's op-ed, which said, which was called "Why I Pray for Donald Trump," yeah. and 
And last year, um, we began asking Democrats, especially in light of what you mentioned earlier, which is that the family has sponsored travel, which included meetings with uh, anti-LGBTQ people, leaders in uh, especially former Soviet countries, but not only. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Ro Khanna and Ted Lieu, both their offices both told us, yeah, we're not really planning to put that high on our to-do list. And then this year, I don't know if you saw this, but it turned out we got a copy of the, the letterhead that went out. And Amy Klobuchar, obviously now running for president, she had been a longstanding, she had spoken publicly. She had um, appeared, she used to appear in their letterhead. Yeah. She was gone from the letterhead this year. And then yeah. after Trump spoke um, last week, Michael Gerson, the former uh, President Bush guy, um, not someone with whom I normally have a lot of common <laughs> ground, he wrote, Democrats have every right and reason to avoid this politicized event next year, and religious people of every background should no longer give credence to this parody of a prayer meeting. So I yeah. wonder, in light of Michael Gerson saying that, whether okay. you have any specific thoughts about Chris Coons continuing to not just be involved, but to be a public face and apparently, you know, the closest thing to a leader in the Senate that this organization has. Yeah, I think that, you know, we've commented on this, that as particularly Democrats continue to step away from this event, what's the breaking point? At what point is it no longer nonpartisan? At what point does our senator recognize what is actually happening in those breakout sessions and in those meetings that, as you said, when we fly people to Eastern European countries, African countries to try to evangelize for the fellowship's mission? Uh, at what point? Do we recognize that this is not a nonpartisan prayer based event solely? Yes, that exists, but there's a lot more happening behind the scenes. And I think that is what I would really call into question. And I think that that should be a question that Chris Coons has to answer. When we know all of these other things are happening, why is this something worth supporting? When we have a president who's obviously politicizing this event, who's obviously making it partisan, who's calling out either Chris Coons himself or potentially it was about, I think Nancy Pelosi at the event also that made was a comment some, about praying yeah, for him. Right. So perhaps that's what he was reacting to. But if this person is saying, right, essentially to your face, I I don't like that. I don't like you and I don't like it. What, at You're what lying. Point, yeah. Yeah. He's calling yeah. you a liar. He's right. saying he doesn't like it. I, at what point do we step back and we say, you know what, this is something we have to stand against. And, and for me, it would not be an event that I would be attending. I, I know that. And is this something that you talk about with, with uh, everyday folks in Delaware, or it's more of a niche political thing? They don't care. I think the what we were talking about, that intersection with Mount Air and pollution and allowing corporations to abuse people, that part, absolutely. The prayer breakfast itself, for people who know about it, it's certainly something that I'm willing to talk about, but it's not not the message we're necessarily going to the doors with. And can I ask you um, how you would describe yourself, how you think about yourself in terms of faith, your faith, if any? Uh, I don't practice any faith. I think that I really de divide or derive faith from a belief that we need to take care of each other and that we are all interconnected. And that that is what I, that was really what guides me, but I do not uh, practice a religion. And does that mean that you don't believe in God? Uh, I don't know if it does. I, mean, <laughs> I don't think, I don't, I think it might. You know, I was raised Catholic and there's, there's parts of that, that when I was younger were important to my family, but it has not um, been something that I've continued into my adulthood. And something, and I would, it used to be that that, that, that kind of uh, profession of religious faith was was considered an absolute inherent baked in part of any political campaign. Do people in Delaware care what your religious beliefs are? Some people have asked me and I, I answer really similarly to the way that I just did. I mean, there mm -hmm. are things that I believe in. There's there's something that I feel guides me, um, but it is not necessarily an organized religion. Can you talk a little bit about um, what uh, I'm assuming you're getting some degree of support from out of state. And I'm wondering if you can sort of characterize what your donors from out of state, what's important to them as it compares to the people, the residents, the voters within Delaware. I've been 
interesting. I haven't necessarily asked people separately. Um, I think there are people um, out of state who see Chris Coons as a barrier to progressive politics and to the policies that a we want to put forward, whether it's us or Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, they see him as a senator who will actually block the progress that those candidates are running on. I think in state, there are a lot of people who, like I said, don't feel like he is legislated in their favor, who don't feel that he is accessible to them or cares about the things that are going on in their lives. They don't feel represented by him. So I think in some ways it's They overlap. There are certainly people here who are committed to progressive politics and see him as a barrier and see this as an opportunity to remove a barrier. And then there's people who just feel like he has not been someone who represents their interests. Are you getting from from out of state the support that uh, that you think you should? Meaning (laughs) we're in an environment now where progressives nationally, right, they're starting to become more attuned, I would argue, to people like, you know, the next AOC or whatever it might be, progressive <laughs> yeah. candidates who might have a realistic chance of of um, of challenging and taking nominations away from, from Democrats who are, you know, uh, confirming Trump judicial appointees, things like that. Are you, are you performing at that level or do you feel like progressives around the country are not, have not really woken up yet to what you're doing and, and the, the realistic uh, possibility that you could succeed. Yeah, well, I mean, that's why I'm talking to you, right? I got to make sure that more people know about us. I, I do think that there are more people that need to know about our campaign, obviously. I think that until everyone does, we haven't reached enough people. Um, what I think is interesting is we do have a later primary. We are not until September 15th. So there are a lot of people who are going in March and April, and they're rightfully so. There's a lot of focus on getting them through the door. Uh, my hope is that for your presidential are, primary, for, uh, our, our presidential primary is in April, right. but our our statewide is in September. Exactly. So there are other there are I think progressive energy that will have worked really hard in March and in April in, in some of these primary states. And as the spring goes on and summer kicks in, we will be the place for people to come and for people to help and and push us across the finish line. That's so not to say we don't have engaged people here now we've had uh you know we've got more than 100 volunteers who are actively either made a phone call knocked on a door participated in some way in our campaign um we've received uh, thousands of donations so we are certainly not in a poor bad place but i always think that there are more people who need to know about us because of the reasons that i'm stating like senator coons will not get on board with progressive politics, he has made that clear. So we, these are the types of senators that we need to replace. And in a like, state like uh, Delaware, it's not, it's small, right? Like we're talking of essentially a congressional district for a Senate seat. So the, your money goes a long way in a state like Delaware. Yeah. So hopefully people sounds, to invest in that. Yeah, and it sounds like you're saying, unless I got this wrong, it sounds like you're saying that once Delaware votes in the presidential primary in April, a lot of that progressive energy and focus you're expecting might turn to what your your campaign and your race. And not just presidential. I think there are there are statewide primaries happening in other states where in March that there's a lot of energy focusing on the, getting those people across the finish line right now. I'm hoping that once we get some wins there, uh, people are engaged and they're recognizing we can do it. And then even more attention comes toward us. That's not to say we are we are not, uh, people aren't aware of us though. I think there are quite a few people who are, and that's the, our, the work that we are doing is to make sure as many people um, know about our campaign and what we stand for. And frankly, how Chris Coons is a barrier to progress, that those are the things that are important to communicate. Is there anything we haven't covered that, that you were really hoping we would get to or that you wanna make sure people know about before we go? Um, we didn't really talk about my platform, but I could hit on that a little well, bit. Well, we, we you hit know? some of those points. <laughs> we right? hit some of it. You're oh, right. Yeah. You're right. It's, we start, we've it. intersected pieces. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, what I'm really voting on is, as I mentioned, making our country work for every single one of us. I think that right now it works really well for the wealthy and for the already powerful, but not for everybody else. And in this country, there's no reason for anybody to struggle. We can guarantee a dignified standard of living to every single person. 
And I think the ways that we do that are by guaranteeing universal comprehensive health care. I we've talked about schools in Delaware. I think funding, equitably funding education is incredibly important to our country going forward. And I think it has to come from the federal level. We have put too much of it on the state and it is led about to the problems that we have. Entirely overhauling the model that we have now where it's based on local property taxes and all that. Yeah. That's inherently unequal, right? Like that's the tool that districts have, but it's inherently unequal. And it's why we have the results that we do. So how do we fix that? How do we change that model? That to me also includes free public childcare, pre-K, public education, all the way through trade school or college. Um, there are far too many kids who have that knocking doors who told me they didn't go to college because not because they didn't want to or because they didn't think they could, but because they really just couldn't afford it. And that should not be a barrier to um bettering yourself or getting an education. Uh, the other piece we did talk about combating climate change. I believe that we need to be taking truly bold action in the Green New Deal. I think that that is something that our country should be prioritizing and putting a focus on to the degree that we tried to get to the moon. Like this is the level of, of investment that I think we should be making in that. Uh, I also believe we need to fight for economic justice. So raising the minimum wage to at least $15 an hour. That is something else that Chris Coons has outwardly opposed. He says that it's too high in some places. It's not too high anywhere. We know that, especially in our state. Um, it costs about $18 an hour to get a one-bedroom apartment in our state and still be comfortable. So 15 is a bare minimum, and we need to make sure that we go up from there. I also really support um, democracy in the workplace. So things like encouraging union membership, encouraging worker co-ops or co-own co-ownership with workers. I think the vast majority of people spend many of their waking hours at work and it is one of the least democratic places that we, we spend our time. We absolutely have to fix that and that's how we fight back against wealth inequality. And, and finally, I also believe in a homes guarantee. I think that in a country as wealthy as ours, there's no reason that every single person can't have a roof over their head. And again, it is solely because we've chosen not to do that, that we haven't solved that problem. So there's much more to it, um, but those are the core pillars that that I talk about both with voters and I hear from voters the most of what they the change they need to see in their life. Well, that's a perfect segue because the next thing I was going to ask you was if people want to know more, if they want to know how to support you, if they want to know where you stand more specifically on other issues, what can they do? Where can they go? Yeah, they can go to JessForDelaware.com. Jess or Jessica? Jess. JessForDelaware.com. F-O-R-D-E-L-A-W-A-R-E.com. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, uh, anything else before we go? No, I just appreciate the time so much. Please, if this is the type of uh, race that you think you should get involved in, please do. Please donate. Please volunteer. You can volunteer from anywhere in the world. We have literally people volunteering from Norway making <laughs> calls for us and, and doing work for us. So this is a this is a campaign that that is worth being involved with. Jessica Rain challenging incumbent Senator Chris Coons for the Delaware Democratic nomination for Senate this year. Thanks so much for joining me here on TYT Investigates. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. Bye now.